It seems like Christmas is coming faster and faster every year. I don't know about you, but I do my best not to listen to Christmas music until after Thanksgiving is over. But I've got a problem. I've got a seven-year-old and a four-year-old at home, and they've been excited about Christmas since August. There, there's nothing I could do, and to a certain degree, I've, I've just kind of leaned into it. Like, I've just gotten excited <laughs> living life and seeing Christmas through, through their eyes. The presents and the gifts and the advent calendars and all the excitement and the lists that they make, there's nothing I can do to slow them down. They are so incredibly excited about December 25th. And for me, I love that. And, and as their dad, I just want to make sure that they don't miss the bigger picture, that they really do grasp, even at a young age, the reason for the season. And that's, that's really what this Advent series is all about, that we all pause for just a moment and remember the purpose, the original intent of this holiday and, and why it is that we're celebrating it. And as their dad, I understand the truth that it's better to give than to receive. And that's why I have such a newfound respect for Christmas. But as a son of God, I need to stop myself and humbly remember that sometimes it's better to receive than to give. That I just need to stop in this season and receive the gift of Christ's birth, Christ's life, and Christ's death. And that's the beauty of what we're doing in this Advent series. We're taking a look today, this theme of love in week two. This idea that God so loved the world that he gave his only son to us in such a way that we can now share this love with the rest of the world. And what I think is so cool about this season and the reason why the Jones family grabs a Christmas ornament off the ornament tree every year is, is to remember that concept, to remember that we were given love so that we could show love. And so Christmas outreach, it looks a little different this year. We're not on campus and we're not grabbing ornaments and yet the concept remains the same. If you haven't yet, head over to northcoastchurch.com and click on our Christmas outreach banner. From there, you're gonna have an opportunity to bless a family with the gift of Christmas in three different ways. You can buy a gift card for a family in need from the site. You can donate money directly to a partner organization or you can even commit to purchasing a present for a child that normally wouldn't be getting one this time of year. If you do choose to commit to purchasing a gift, choose the gift on our site, purchase the item in a store or an online retailer, attach your receipt to the gift, and then drop it off at your campus's location on the weekend of December the 13th. What a great way to show God's love during the season and what a great reminder of what God did for us. So now we're gonna find out exactly why sometimes it is better to receive than to give. Hey everyone, my name is Trent Jenkins. I'm a campus pastor out in Fallbrook. And I'm Gina Sir. I work on the Vista campus in the children's ministry. And Trent, can you believe we're about two weeks out from Christmas 2020? It is crazy, two weeks out. I know in my own home, the excitement is brewing for my two girls. It is an exciting time. It's also been a challenging year. But today, with the second week of Advent, we are celebrating something that's certain, and that's God's love yes. for us. Now, love is a very overused word, but there's lots of different ways to define it and explain it, aren't there? Yeah, it seems like uh, the word love gets used and attached to so many things. I, I often say, I love ice cream or I love Christmas. And we attach these emotions to it, but God's definition is very different from the world's and he describes it as a verb, as an action. And Paul describes it in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and he says that love is kind, love is patient. He uses these descriptive words of action. And Gina, I know in my own home, for my girls, they really get to see love displayed, not so much in the hallmark uh, movie moment of being around a fireplace, but ultimately when adversity strikes, when obstacles come, am I still loving or am I still kind? And we get to see that displayed in the life of Christ when he showed us love when adversity struck. It's exactly the response we see from God because if we're honest, we're pretty messy, we're broken, we're sinful people. And Jesus left heaven to come live among that. In fact, in Philippians 2.8, it says, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. I love that verse. And it may not seem like it's a great verse to use during this Christmas season, but I think it describes the Christmas season to a T. You see, God gave us his son. His son came to us and Jesus gave his life for us, it's the ultimate act of love. It is, those are great action words. He came, he lived, and he died 
Those are perfect words to express the love God has for us. And that's what we're celebrating as we light the second Advent candle. So as we celebrate the second Advent candle of love, it's a chance for you to be able to express that love back to Him. Now let's join in with our worship team as we respond to that perfect act of love.
Dun 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 dun. Yeah, I don't know what you wanted me to do there. Sorry. <laughs> this is going to be so much fun because one, I get to introduce all of you. If you haven't been able to meet her or see her yet, to my incredible wife, the most amazing wife in the history of all of womankind. Sorry, ladies, I know you're rolling your eyes. You can fight for who's in second place. Number one is locked up forever. This is my incredibly awesome wife, Amy, an amazing mom. And here's the deal: I wanted her to do this message with me today, and yet I couldn't tell what we're doing. And I know right now she's sitting here going, this is the cruelest thing I probably could have done to you. And I'm like, trust me, we're going to edit this. No one will ever see it. It's just going to be you and I. I knew I could not get you up in front of a crowd on a weekend, but in front of a camera. You did it. You maybe. did it. Yep. So on a scale of like zero to 10 right now, like how nervous are you? Um, I'd say eight. Eight? I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's better than a ten. <laughs> it's better than but a ten. But here's the problem: if I would have told her and gone through this with her, she wouldn't have slept for like the last seven nights. No, True. He knows me well. Yep. You did. Well. So we're gonna do this because we're talking about Advent and we're talking about love today, and we're talking about Christmas season. Now look, don't turn it off if you're like, I'm not in the mood for some romantic love story. No, no, this is just gonna set up what all of us need to hear about Christmas, because it's Christmas season. When mm -hmm. you think of Christmas, babe. Come on, what are the images, what are the memories that pop in your head when you think of Christmas? I think of um, our kids getting up early to open presents. I think of Christmas lights, driving around looking at Christmas lights. Yeah, presents, stuff. And this yeah. is a hugely nostalgic time of year. We take more photos, more videos than mm -hmm. at any other time of the year, most of us. Mm -hmm. And commercialization has kind of changed Christmas. When you think of commercials, what are they telling you? They're telling me, if you don't love me, I mean, if you love me, buy me a diamond ring. <laughs> really? Yes. You got to stop watching commercials. <laughs> I know. Because here, where's your ring? Yeah, yeah. We Look got magic. This. We don't even have diamonds. <laughs> no diamond. Okay, boys and girls that are just uh, thinking about getting engaged, we got both these rings for 190 bucks. At the Pasadena Jewelry Mart. Yeah, we got a good deal. 27 years ago. Yeah. And they have lasted 27 years, and they work for marriage. So, yeah. um, you know what commercials tell me, as long as you bring it up, if you love me, you'd buy me a truck. Sorry, babe. Or a Lexus. Nope, not gonna happen. <laughs> You're not getting your diamond yeah. and we're gonna be happy. <laughs> yes. That's how this thing works. Cause we've got this heightened sense, this romanticized love that comes out at Christmas time. Mm -hmm. And yet our relationship started right around this time 28 years ago. It did, yeah. Remember first date, first, it wasn't first meeting. You had cut my hair. We're at Azusa Pacific University. Mm -hmm. You're a senior, yep. I'm a freshman. I'm two years older than you, and after two years of college, I'm still a freshman. That's all you need to know about this part of the story. Yep. Um, and a group of friends, your friends, not mine, because my friends wouldn't hang out with yours. Your friends wouldn't hang out with mine. Um, we went to a Christmas program right. on APU campus. And afterwards? Everybody wanted to get together and do something, but when it came down to it, they all kind of bailed out on it, and it was just us. And it was a theater right across the street. You remember the movie? A Few Good Men. She's good. <laughs> Um, starring? Demi Moore, uh, Tom Cruise, Jack Nicholson. Yep. Who else was in Kevin it? Bacon. Know. Everything yeah. has Kevin Bacon. And uh, it was December of 92. Right. Uh, and I remember one by one, your friends are like, I got to study or I got to get ready to pack and go home or I'm going to close down whatever. Mm -hmm. And it was me, you, and some guy I don't remember. Redhead guy, I don't remember his okay, name. Okay, it doesn't matter. Yeah. If you're the redhead guy, you're part of our story. <laughs> it's okay. But I remember I'm doing my best mental telepathy with that guy going, get out of here, get out of here. And finally he's like, hey, I'm not going to stick around either. Probably because I was looking at him going, get out of here. <laughs> um, and I looked at you and I'm like, so do you just want to go to the movie? Yeah, and I said, yeah, let's go. Do you consider that our first date though? I would consider it our first date because we were by ourselves. And yeah, but I didn't like set up a, a date movie. or ask you out. Yeah, I still consider it our first date. Second date. Unofficial first date. Okay, okay our second date. Second date was to go look at Christmas lights in Pasadena. Yeah. And it was pouring down it rain. It was pouring rain. I remember that. And I remember right before we left, you drove us over to these like little modular uh, apartments they had on campus. And you were like, come on, I have to go pick up something. Come on out. And I was like, I don't want to get out. It's raining. I'll just oh. wait here for you. I was, so see, here's the deal. Uh, where my roommates and I lived in this trailer park. It's called the Mods, but yeah. it's a trailer park. And our place was just a rat's nest. But I had friends who had a really cool trailer. They were all gone for the night. And mm -hmm. I thought, I'm going to make dinner. And so I had cooked dinner. I got pasta ready. I had tomato sauce. I had cheese. I had garlic bread. That's the easy man's dinner. Yeah. I had candles lit. I went and picked you up, came back. And I was trying to figure out how to get you inside. Right. And I was like 
no, you're just trying to show me off, or I don't know what you were doing. You thought that about I yourself. Thought that, did you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, and this tells you about our relationship. She was embarrassed to be seen with me. So <laughs> she's like, I'm not going I to this guy's house. These are the cool guys on campus. <laughs> I'm like, come on, you got to go. And I remember just getting her out of the car to walk into this place with me. She says, no, just go. No, it's raining. Chris, I'm fine. And I'm like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end this right here. I was always difficult. I remember <laughs> opening the door. We mm -hmm. walked in. I had Inya playing. Mm -hmm. I still remember that. Mm -hmm. Inya is playing. Candles are lit. And you said, it looks like someone's having a romantic evening. Yes. And I said, I hope we are. It was, I was so shocked. I was like, no way, you did all this? This is amazing. Now, here, here's what I found out later. I cooked everything she's allergic to. I didn't know that for until like six months. You don't eat tomato sauce. You don't do cheese. Oh, yeah. Back you don't do much pasta yeah, at all. Right, right. But she said, I loved there. it and I ate it and it was super fun. And then we went and we never found the light show in Pasadena. We drove around for a long time. We found some lights. And Maybe because it was unplugged. Yeah. We didn't have directions, no yeah. smartphones, but we're driving around the hills of like Pasadena area. I'm looking for this neighborhood that's supposed to be decked out in lights. Mm -hmm. I'm stopping at homes where you can just see a Christmas tree in the window and I'm talking about <laughs> the lights and she's doing this. She's I'm laughing. laughing and I'm stopping for stoplights and I'm like, look how this one turns red and then yellow and green and she's I'm laughing. laughing and I'm like, oh, she thinks I'm funny. Yes, I did think you were funny. You're still funny. I'm funny. I thought you were cute. Oh, smart, I would have taken just witty, funny. Cool. And this is how it began 28 years ago. Let, let me tell you what didn't happen after that. Because I was, I was already smitten. I was just one look at you and I knew. And then hanging out with you, I'm like, oh my gosh, this woman is amazing. And what didn't happen is the next few weeks, um, when I called, she didn't hang up on me. When I went by the apartment, um, the door wasn't locked. Um, she didn't ghost me. She didn't tell me, look, I'm not interested in you. You need to knock it off. Really, this isn't going any further. When I didn't pay attention to that, she didn't tell her roommates, tell him to knock this off. Her roommates weren't saying, dude, give it a break. Dude, you don't have a shot with her. She's the athletic trainer for the sports teams at APU because she was now physical therapist, but they're athletic, athletic trainer. She didn't go to the football team. She didn't get the offensive line to show up at my door and just go, look, knock it off. Or we're going to break you into pieces. None of that happened. See, if, if that would have happened, which I expected it to happen, your roommates were praying for that to happen. She had a Bible study on campus praying against me. Isn't that, that's good for your pastor to be able to say out loud, 28 years later, I'm okay with it. None of that happened. Because if that would have happened, it wouldn't be me and you here today. Right. And if it wasn't you in my life, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today. I'm sure of that because mm -hmm. she is the absolute secret to success that all of you now know to the Brown family and the power and strength behind my ministry. Mm -hmm. You're going to cry. I know. You're going to make me cry. <laughs> she cries a lot. That's <laughs> her <do>. spiritual <laughs> gift. Um, that didn't happen. See, for this love and a relationship to work, it has to be reciprocal. Mm -hmm. um, there were other girls I was interested in and they wouldn't give me the time of day. That's why they're not standing here today and they're probably <laughs> going, dodge that one. But for you and I, this worked because mm -hmm. I really liked her. She started to really like me and this thing started to grow. And for you to have any real love relationship, you have to understand it's reciprocal. Mm -hmm. And this is what we want to talk about today. Because you're not going to get Christmas until you understand love has a source and an example. And it's not you. It's not you. See, I grew up in a church my whole life where some guy would get up here and he would pound on a, we called it a pulpit at that time. And uh, he would tell us about how we're supposed to love God. And yet I would hear about this angry God who created a hell in case I got out of line and I'm supposed to love him. And it was so one-sided. And I found myself going to church being told the love of God. And I, I, it was hard for me to love people, mm -hmm. let alone an invisible God who was angry at me. And no wonder I didn't have much of a chance to have this real relationship with God. It's impossible to truly experience Christmas without understanding love. You, you can go through the Christmas season. You can have a good holiday. But you will never, ever experience the true purpose, meaning of Christmas without understanding love. And understanding you are not the beginning of that love. You are not the source of that love. And you are not the example. You are the receiver of that love. So here's what I want you to do. Okay, here's what we have you read. I printed it out for you. Thank you. Our text today is 1 John chapter 4. 1 John. So don't go to the book of John. Go to the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. Go to the very back. In fact, start in the back, Revelation, and work backwards. You're going to see a 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. 1 John chapter 4. This is a different kind of Christmas story. If you got your note sheets, I hope you have it out right now. I'm going to read you today. You're going to read. I'm going to read. A different type of Christmas story. Not the one you usually think of in the Bible. There's no manger here. There's no baby wrapped in swaddling clothes. But let me promise you, this is going to become your favorite 
Christmas story because it gives you the source and the example of love. Are you ready? I'm ready. Here we go. This hey. is weird. I've never had anyone else read scripture. I know. Words. It's kind of fun. First John 4, 7 through 19. Dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Okay, wait, wait, wait. For love comes from God. What, what do we do when we get to something like that? We Circle, highlight, underline. She's good. <laughs> Jeez, I listen. Circle, highlight, underline. Let me tell you what your Christian life is going to be based on love. And let me tell you, it doesn't come from you. Love comes from God. Can I keep interrupting? Yes, okay, please, keep going, please, keep going. please. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. Okay, listen, this is a Christmas story. This is how God showed his love among us. This is how you know there is a God who loves you. Circle, highlight, underline, go. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. Stop, stop. Game changer. Game changer. This is love. Not that we love God. But you have to first come to an understanding that God loved us. I'm going to say this in about 20 different ways over the next, what do I got? 20 minutes. I'm going to say this over and over and giving you an example, Old Testament and New Testament. Oh, please hear this. Christian, this is love. Not that you come week in and week out to a Bible study and you try to learn, how do I love an invisible God? How do, no, no. This is love. It comes from him. Not that we love him, but that God loved us. Keep going. I'm getting okay. excited about this. Okay. And sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Verse 13, this is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit and we have seen and testify that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. Stop, stop. Stop, stop. This is Christmas. How do we know what love is? How do we know that God demonstrated or showed his love, that God amongst because he sent his one and only son to be the savior of the world? This is the Christmas story. This is the genesis of love. And this is what you and I are going to come to understand at a greater reality, a new depth today to go, man, I can walk in this. And Christmas is no longer a season or a day. It is a lifestyle of receiving, not from others, but from God. Go ahead, I'm getting excited. Okay. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Isn't, well, well, isn't that good? Mm -hmm. That's not what I got from church. There's a God to be feared and you better love him. How can you have a relationship that's one-sided? You can become a stalker if a relationship's one-sided. Mm -hmm. You can get a restraining order if a relationship is one-sided, but you cannot have a loving relationship unless it's reciprocal. Right. Why are we here? Because for some reason, unbeknownst to her, her family, her friends, in a Bible study that was praying against me, she really liked hanging out with this goofball. This 23-year-old freshman who's already been to college, Palomar University, I don't call it a college, Palomar University for two years, and her friends are like, you could do better. And the reality is she could do better, but I'm driving around in my little Honda Civic CRX going, I can't believe she's sitting next to me. I can't believe she wants to do this. I can't believe she said yes again. And this is the genesis and the beginning of this. And it didn't start in fear of Amy or Amy's fear of me, but a perfect love that drives out fear. Oh, this is the best Christmas story. Please tell me there's more. There is. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Circle, highlight, underline. Why do we love God? Because he first loved us. Let me ask you something. Why do we love God? Because he first loved us. But when it comes to a Christian saying, how am I supposed to love God? Why do we love God? You say it again. Oh, because he first loved us. <laughs> <laughs> so let me tell you something. Let me ask you something. How in the world are you truly living a Christian existence if you have not fully realized how much the creator loves you as his creation? How? <laughs> let me answer that. You can't. You can't live a life of love without knowing and understanding the source of love, the example of love, what God has already done to demonstrate his love for us and receive that because then we now have the love for ourselves and the love for each other. Isn't that good? It is so good. 
So here's what we're gonna do. I know you got some fill in the blanks. We're gonna jump into putting Christmas in the right perspective. How do we put Christmas in the right perspective? Wait, wait, so, wait. Is this where you start teaching and yep, I stand here I've got like three pages. Smile, cute, and... Yeah. yeah. I think I'm going to... Come on, one. I'll give you some stuff to read I, or do. No, no, no. Okay. You're going to be great. Love you. Love you. Okay, <laughs> bye. <laughs> this is awesome. Thanks, babe, for putting up with me. That was big. Oh, you should have seen the 10 minutes before the camera ran. So what are we doing? Are you going to tell me anything or where it's going? I go, no, babe, you're going to be fine. And she was amazing. So let me give you a perspective of Christmas right now. Amy set up the most amazing Christmas passage that we've ever heard. And putting in the right perspective is this. The reason for the season is sin. The reason for the season is sin. Now, th this shouldn't surprise you. It shouldn't catch you off guard because a couple years ago, I did an entire message just on this. But if you miss this, you miss Christmas. The reason for the season is not, well, God loved us and God sent his son just to walk. No, the reason we have Christmas is sin. Let me take you on a little journey right now. I don't have Amy to read for me anymore, so I got to put on my own peepers and do this. Here we go. Um, I put some verses there, but Matthew 1, 18 to 21. These are some of the most familiar verses in the Bible about Christmas. Let me read them. Now, with you having a filter of listening, watching for sin, listen to this. Remember, Mary comes to Joseph and says, look, I'm, I'm pregnant, but I know you haven't laid with me and it's no one else's baby. It's from God. And Joseph's like, peace, done. I ain't falling for this. Ain't going to be no Holy Spirit baby around. I don't know who you've been with, but I'm out. And this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Now, because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man, he did not want to expose her to public disgrace so he had, had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son. You are to give him the name Jesus because, circle, highlight, underline, he will save his people from their sins. Chapter one, first book of the New Testament. After 400 years of silence from the Old Testament, the Jewish nation, the world is waiting for this savior, this redeemer. Chapter one, God says, let me tell you it's time. And let me tell you why Christmas is happening. You will name him Jesus and he will save the world from their sin. This is the reason for the season. Why did God come? Your sin. Now, look, before we get dark and dreary and just put this big black eye on Christmas, let me tell you, this is going to turn into the best news you've ever heard in your entire life. But we have to come to grips on the reason. You know, Chris, you're making a lot out of one verse. Sure I am. It's the Bible. But let me make a lot of a couple verses. Let's turn to the book of Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke chapter 2. One of the most famous parts of the Bible on Christmas ever. And it simply says this. In Luke 2, 8, there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for circle, highlight, underline all people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloth lying in a manger. When the angels appeared to shepherds watching over their flocks by night, what was the story? Don't be afraid. There is good news for all people. You now have a savior, which begs the question, doesn't it? Say from what? Is there a raiding party out in the field? Is there coyotes around looking at the little sheep? Is there a wolf in the area? Is there a bear? Is there a lion? What do we need saved from? And it goes back to the reason for the season is what? Sin. This is good news for every single one of us. Christmas begins with sin. Yours. Yours. <laughs> Let me just ask you a question then. Because over time, we've lost sin from Christmas. Why was there a manger? Haven't you stopped and asked just so God could show that he liked people and walk among us? Mm -hmm. Why are there wise men? Why are there shepherds? Why is there a Christ, a Messiah, Hebrew word, Jewish word, in, in Christmas? Sin. How often do you see sin as a part of Christmas today? Do you drive around town and go, man, there's another big sin in lights? No. Do you have a sin on your tree? 
You have a big black ornament, like just kind of dripping and go, oh, that's the sin ornament. Ah, you have sin wrapping paper, just a bunch of sin written all over. No, let's open this one. No. Any of you have the cool, what's it, the laser things on the houses now that do snowflakes and stuff so you don't have to put up anything, just stick it in your yard? Anybody have a sin laser where sin just drops on your house over and over? No. Some of us feel like sin is dropping on our house right now this season, and we'll get to understanding why that is. But it's almost as if we omitted sin from this season. In fact, I bet all of us here, North Coast, and Kailua, and those of you at Green Oak, and those of you in Hillsboro, and all across North County and beyond, my bet is, if I ask you, top 20 things that you're going to find in Christmas, none of us would put sin. Any think of any Christmas songs with sin? Oh, there's some there. Not any new ones. We got stuff about Frosty and Reindeer and we got stuff about Jingle Bells Rock and we got Mommy Kissing Santa Claus and we got Baby It's Cold Outside. And if you look at those lyrics, we may be getting back to sin. Don't do it right now. Just listen. You know of Christmas songs that talk about sin? I had to do some searching on that this week. It's one of the oldest Christmas carols still in existence today. Dated back to the 16th century or even earlier. Some think the 15th century. You're going to see this as soon as it shows up on the screen. Brandon, let's do this. Got this one? I know, the, the first verse gives it away. God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day to save us from Satan's power. <laughs> when we were gone astray, oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy, oh, tidings of comfort and, what was this? Why was Christ a savior born on Christmas day? See, the early Christmas songs get this right. The early Christmas songs take us back and go, you know why you can rest as merry people? You know why you can live a life without dismay? Because we have a savior on Christmas day to save us from Satan's power. When we had gone astray, sin, it's just three letters. It's a small little world, but it has a huge impact. It's what separates you and I from this love that God has from us. Why? Because we've all gone astray. <laughs> and I'm now trapped in an enemy's camp who just doesn't want me to hang out and have a loving relationship with God because he knows people that really walk in love and receive love and give love are going to be highly infectious. And they're going to bounce into and bump into and come across other people that are, need saving from Satan's power. Other people that aren't merry, that walk in dismay. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. I know, I had to look it up too. What is tidings? News or information? Oh, great news or information of comfort and joy. Comfort and joy. One of the earliest Christmas songs we have in existence today takes us back to early Christmas. Far from mommy kissing Santa Claus, they understood this is the reason for Christmas. Uh, okay, you want to go to maybe one of the best known Christmas carols composed by Adolph Adam in 1847? This one. Oh, it's too, too, I can't sing this one and it's too slow for me. But oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining until he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Oh, fall on your knees. Isn't that good? And hear the angels' voices. O night divine, O night when Christ was born. O holy night. Now I would ask you, name one of the top 10 Christmas songs of all time and I bet every one of us would put this in our top 10 list. It was the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining. I thought pining was just a wanting for something, like, oh, I'm pining for coffee this morning. But let me read you actually the definition of pining. To yearn deeply, to suffer with longing, to long pay painfully for something. Isn't that good? To yearn deeply, to suffer with longing, to long painfully for something. You know what our world lays in today? Because of our sin, our error, because of the brokenness in our relationship with God because of page three of the Bible, 
page one and two, a God of love created us to have a great relationship with him. Page three, he let us have our own free will and our own choice. And we have chosen not to walk with this God. And because of that, it's called sin. We do our own way. That's called disobedience. It doesn't mean we're all doing evil things. We're just walking contrary to how God wants us to walk. And what do we do? We lay in the brokenness of this world in sin and error and we're pining. We're longing for something. We don't have the family we're supposed to have. We don't have the marriage we're supposed to have. I don't have the joy I'm supposed to have. I don't have the gentleness I'm supposed to have. I don't have the character I'm supposed to have. I don't have the, you fill in the blank, why we're missing something. The journey we've all put ourselves on has come up lacking (laughs) until he appeared and the soul felt its worth. Two years before I met that gorgeous woman that was up here is where my soul was searching for worth. I was trying through everything out here to find something in life. And the problem was in here. See, this is an internal solution, not external. Our Christmas season now says what is wrapped under the tree or what is parked in your driveway or what is put on your finger. Man, that is where the soul finds its worth. But the problem is not an external problem. It's not what you have, what you don't have, who you have or who you don't have this season. That's not the problem with your Christmas season. The problem with your Christmas season is that we lay in a broken state because of our own sin and our own error of thinking we could choose our own right and wrong. And Adam and Eve chose to eat the fruit on page three of the Bible, their own right and wrong. And they lost peace with God. They lost the love of God and with God. Don't worry, we hit peace next week. And then I love this. So fall on your knees. Did you get that? It's not stand up and dance. It's not run around and sing praises. No, you know what the solution is? You fall on your knees. It's a place of repentance to fall on your knees, to hear the angel voices, oh, night divine, O night, when Christ was born. Isn't that good? See, our earliest hymns of Christmas got this. If we lose the reason for Christmas, then we lose the motive. So let me give you number two. You see, the motive for the season is love. The motive for the season Well, that's love. If the reason for the season is sin, we lay in brokenness, we're apart from God, we're separated from God, and therefore he's the source of love. He's the example of love. How how can I really love people in my life? How can I truly have loving relationships if I'm broken from the source of real love? No wonder why we're pining, we're longing for something else. But when we understand the reason is sin, the motive is, is love. See, I told you this was going to become good news. This wasn't going to be a dark and dreary Christmas. It's what God has already done. You see, God started this relationship, not you. This is love. Not that you love God, but that he first loved us. This is Christianity. This is Christmas. Understanding he gave a savior. Why? Just as he told Joseph and Mary, I'm going to save you from your sin. You can't do this on your own. You can't get good enough on your own. You can't get enough religion on your own. God said, it's something I'm going to do. And the motive is love. You want to know a cool little geeky, nerdy fact about the Bible? The first time love is ever mentioned in the Bible. First book of the Bible, Genesis, but it doesn't come till chapter 22. It's not about God loving his people. It's not the Bible saying, here's how you have to love God. It's in a story of a man named Abraham and Sarah. And God said, Abraham, if you move away, if you leave everything, if you trust me, follow me, I'll take you to a land. I'll make you into a great nation. But you see, Abraham is 99. His wife, Sarah, is 89, 90 at this point. You're long past the days of having kids. And God gives him a son. God gives him Isaac. And when Isaac's a young man, 12, 13 years old, something like that, God does the strangest thing in Genesis 22. And the first time love is ever mentioned, God told Abraham, take your son whom you love and sacrifice him to me. The first time love is ever used in the Bible. It's of a man and a son. And God said, I want you to take him up the mountain and sacrifice him to me. Now you go, whoa, whoa, that is not a loving God. That is a cruel God. And God God did not want anyone to kill a child. Abraham takes his son up the mountain, makes an altar, raises a knife. And God goes, no, no, Abe, 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 Abe. I just want to know where your heart was, buddy. I just want to know if you would follow me and obey me. 
Take your son off the altar. You know the first time love shows up in the New Testament? The back of the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the first time love shows up in the New Testament, it's the book of Matthew, chapter three. Not how God loves us, not how we love God. Jesus is being baptized in the Jordan River and a voice from heaven says, this is my son whom I love. (laughs) The first time in the Old Testament, it's the sacrifice of an only son. The first time in the New Testament, love shows up in scripture. It's the sacrifice of the son of God. It's as if God reserved that word both times to show the depth of the gift that was being done. What it took. I mean, what makes a great Christmas gift this year? What makes a great gift? The value of it, okay, the value could have something to do with it, the price of it, the rarity of it, man, this is one of a kind or something I made or something I did for you, how personalized it was to you, how useful it was. This is Christmas. So God showed his love in this. He sent his son, his only son, of that price, of that value for you, for your sin, because someone has to pay for your sin. Because when you die, you can't go to heaven with sin, but heaven's gonna be filled with a bunch of sinners. If he's really a God of love, he's got to be a God of justice and he has to do something about your sin and error. He can't leave it unpunished. That's unjust. And an unjust God is unloving. So he said, I'll send my son. My only son. This is the rarity of this gift. And this is for you. His death, you can receive that as payment for your sin. That's what Christmas is all about. It's about sin and then showing what God did to get to you And to get to me. See, some of us come to Christmas or God's love and we have this, if God really loved me, he would give me what? A truck, diamonds. What is it? A relationship or things? Well, if God loved me, he he wouldn't have taken her from my life or him. Or if God loved me, how come I don't have him or her? Or if God loves me, how come we don't have this? Or how come we don't have that? It's what God has already done that shows his love. Some of us have a hard time loving God because what he hasn't done. If God really loved me, he would have stopped this from happening. He would have kept this person from dying. If God really loved me, he would have never let this happen in my life. And yet we're blaming God for the result of a broken world that he came to redeem. He didn't come to make this place heaven. He came to do something internally that changes now how we view the external and the world that we live in. God loved first. (laughs) God doesn't ghost you. God, Holy Ghost us. God made it so his presence can walk in us once that we're, I don't know, that was a dad joke. I don't know. God didn't ghost you. He Holy Ghost us. That sin not just forgives us, but allows his spirit to walk in us. So here's what I put. Way too much for the seven minutes I have left. Way too much. It's there in your note sheet. It's got all these verses like Exodus 19 and 20. You you see, before Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments, how we're supposed to follow God, there's Exodus 19. And Exodus 19, he had just led the nation of Israel out of slavery, bondage, out of their oppression, breaking of the Red Sea, crossing them, destroying their enemies. He's bringing them to a promised land. And he tells Moses, Exodus 19, remind the people how I love them. Remind the people how I saved them. Remind the people that I carried them here like on eagle's wings. Remind the people what I did to their enemies. Remind the people that out of all nations, I will make them my treasured possession. Remind the people. And then in three days, have them show up at the mountain. I'm going to give them a glimpse of who I am in thunder and lightning and fire. Oh, you got to read Exodus 19. He spends a whole chapter telling the nation of Israel, here's what I've done for you. And here's a glimpse of the power and might of the God that calls you. And then he says, now here's how I need you to follow me. Here's what obedience looks like. But it comes after the knowledge of what God has done for you. What God has done to you. It is Deuteronomy chapter 6, the great Shema. Shema Israel, Adonai Elohim, Adonai Had. It's this great, if you go to the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, people rock back and forth doing the Shema, the first word in Hebrew here. Hear and understand. And before chapter six of love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Here's how you do family differently. Here's how you do marriage differently. Here's how you do your kids differently. Here's how you work and walk differently. Before the lifestyle of chapter six, there's chapter four and five. Two chapters of God reminding his people, this is what I've done for you. 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 you." He goes back over the history of Israel. And says, this is what I've done for you. Now, here's how to have relationship with me. It is his love first. 
the end of the book of Joshua, the people go into the promised land. They got a new leader in Israel named Josh. Joshua, at the end of his time with the people, stands in front of everyone. And in chapter 24, he spends 13 verses reminding the people, this is what God has done. 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 And then he says, now, if you want to follow God, here's what it looks like. For me and for my household, we will follow the Lord because this is what he's done. Love came first from him. It is John 3, 16. Hilkin did it last week. For God so loved the world that he what? Had warm and happy thoughts. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son for you. It's Romans 5, 8 through 10. But God showed his love for us in this. Why we were still enemies, Christ died for us. He went first. At church, I'm passionate about this. Because I grew up not getting this. I grew up sitting in wooden benches with someone that pounded every week about why I was supposed to love an angry God and why I was supposed to love a God who I could never live up to. I could never meet his expectations. And I tell you, every message I heard about loving God left me more rejected and more deflated. And no one ever sat down and read the Christmas story from 1 John chapter 4 or showed me throughout the entire Old Testament, or Romans 8, or John 3. Whoa, whoa, buddy. Has no one ever told you how much God loves you? Has no one ever laid out the degree of what God has done and given just to get to you? I promise, after that second first date, it's up for Amy to decide which was which. I don't care, 28 years later, it worked. If she would have said, I have nothing to do with you, you're not my type, put a roommate's garden at the door, put the football team against me. I could become a stalker. I could have restraining order out. But 28 years later, we have this amazing love affair that's still going strong. Because for whatever reason, God put in her heart to love this West Texas, boneheaded, thick-hearted dude because he knew I would need a strength like that. I would need a beauty like that. I would need a sensitivity like that. I would need compassion like that. I would need nurturing like that if I would ever, ever make it into ministry. And I love being with her. I want to know her story. I want to know where she came from. I want to know what she was about. I want to see pictures of third grade. I wanted to watch family videos. I wanted to go through photo albums. And it's relationship. It will never be one-sided. So see, the motive for the season is love. The response to the season is completely up to us. <laughs> so what is the response? Well, that's up to you. And that's why some of us this Christmas season are going to go, this is an amazing time of year, but it's not because of this time of year. It's what makes life amazing. Why? Because this is who I am. I'm a guy of incredible sin. I'm a guy today that is still capable of amazing sin and brokenness, and horrors in my life. And in spite of that, this is what God did and showed in abundance to me, in abundance, and said, Chris, my son whom I love, I will put in a manger just so you can have Easter. <laughs> and please understand that, church. If you ever celebrated Christmas without an Easter, you haven't celebrated Christmas. The reason for the manger was simply to get to a cross, to show us how to live a life of love and to take a cross that you and I deserve. You see, that is love. And then the response, well, that's up to you and I. We can continue to lay in our sin and error, pining, wanting, longing for something else, another diamond, another truck, another person, another relationship, another thing to make me whole when the problem isn't external, the problem is internal. Or, or we can choose to fall on our knees after I've heard the angels' voices Good news for all people. I don't care who you are, what you've done, how far you have fallen. That just lets you know how great the love is and how big the cross is. If you weren't a pathetic, worthless sinner, then there was no need for a cross. We would have got a handbook on how to live life better, how to act a little differently, how to be nicer people, and we all get to heaven. We did not get a handbook on how to love people better. We got a book from beginning to end of what God's love has done to pursue us. And in return, he says, now I want all of you. Now I want all of you.
Why? Because that love is transformational. <laughs> it's a love that transforms. You see, accepting the truth about God's love for us, and that's what we have to do. For some of us, we can't accept Christmas. We know who we are and what we've done, or God forbid, what's been done to us. See, because we have brokenness in our life, the enemy wants to tell us we're broken. Nothing could be further from the truth. Because we have sin in our life, the enemy wants to tell us you're just a sinner. Nothing could be further from the truth. There's a God that goes, I know there's brokenness. I know there's sin. That's Christmas. I have to accept the truth about God's love for me. And that changes our love for ourselves. Do you get that? See, when the teacher of the law came to Jesus saying, out of all the commandments, what am I supposed to do? Jesus says, here it is, love God and love others as yourself. See, when I started to understand God's love for me, his grace and mercy, he's never gonna give me what I truly deserve, but he gives me in abundance what I could have never earned. It started to change the way I saw Chris. I didn't have to live for what was out here. I started being okay being alone at night. <laughs> See, the two years before Amy, when I didn't understand it was a soul issue with me. I hated being alone because when I was alone, I didn't like who I was with. And no matter, I was a popular guy. I was a funny guy. I was a life of a party. There wasn't enough out here to change what was in here. But when I started to understand, Chris, stop trying to love this God. Start looking at what he has done over and over again to already love you. I left my stalker Christianity, which wasn't working anyway. It's what God did all throughout the Old Testament. Before I tell you how to love me, I'm going to remind you what I've done, what I've done, what I've done, what I've done, what I've done. It's reciprocal. But he loved us first. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us first. See, that now changes our love for ourselves. I know what Chris is, but in spite of that, this truth overwhelms me. I now have importance. I now have value. I now have a purpose. <laughs> I now have a part to play in his kingdom because I have a title in his family. That is amazing. And what does that do? That provides both a source and example to love others. How are we supposed to love others? Not for me. Believe me. Go, oh, North Coast. Look, you don't want me to love you what comes from me. <laughs> I don't have love. I have sarcasm and that's pretty much it. I have sarcasm. Believe me, you don't want Chris's love in your life. How am I allowed to love people? Because now I have a source and example and the source of God's love and I've received it and it started to transform me, who I am, how I see myself. Now I can give grace and mercy. Oh, trust me, I'm not a guy of grace and mercy. I'm not. I'm a guy of revenge. That's who I am. Yeah, I'm a guy of getting my own way and putting myself first. But now that I have a source and now that I have an example, God's love can work through us. And this is Christmas. You cannot, will not ever do it on your own. If you could have, we would have got a self-help book. We don't. We have a book that says you can't, you won't, you never, ever will. Congratulations. Shut up and accept it. He knows who you are and what you've done. And he cannot, will not ever take his hands, his eyes off of you because he made you exactly the way he wants you to be made and he lost you. And in your sin and error, you're pining for something differently. He says, there's good news, great joy. It's for all people. There's a savior for your sin. That's Christmas. And we've lost that from Christmas. And because of that, many of us dread this holiday and just want to fast forward through it. And it was never meant to be a holiday. It was meant to be every day. Wow, what a story. I end with words from a great theologian. It came without ribbons. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or bags. And he puzzled and puzzled till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. What if Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. What if Christmas perhaps means a little bit more? Hmm. Today you have a response. It can be a depressing holiday. It can remind us of what we still want or what we don't have or who we've lost or who we don't have. It can be a reminder that we don't have the diamonds and we don't have the truck. It can be financially depressing. We are allowed to lay in our sin and air pining or we are allowed to fall on our knees 
and say, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done with the error of my ways and thinking I could solve this and do this. And I realized Christmas was about Easter and a cross because I needed a remedy and a solution for sin internal and nothing out here would do it. Is that you today? I don't know, whatever you're listening, maybe you're driving a car you wanna pull over. Maybe you're sitting at home. Maybe you're with friends right now, but there's something stirring in you going, I've got to respond to this. It's a simple prayer of just saying, God, I'm done with me. I realize I'm a sinner. I've blown it. I've done wrong and I can't fix it. And God, I want you into my life because you died on the cross. You sent your son to take whatever punishment. I received that today. Teach me how much you love me so I can learn how to love you. And the rest of my days, I'm yours. And that is a simple prayer. And I'm going to lead you through it right now. And here's what I'm going to ask. It's hard because we're still speaking to a camera until January 10th, but uh, it's hard. I would love for you to go online, the little comments on there and our digital response card just said, I said that prayer today. We're not going to come to your house, knock on your door. What we're going to do is we want to pray for you in this new journey. If that's you today, and you go, today I'm responding. I'm giving God the only thing he wants for Christmas, me. Then right now, wherever you sit, right between you and God, just in your heart and mind, just pray this prayer with me. Say, God, thanks for letting me hear this today. You know I needed this. I have missed Christmas. I've forgotten it was about my sin and how much you love me and what you did to get to me. Today, I want to say I'm sorry. I'm sorry for living life my way. Today, I accept your love for me. I don't quite get it. I don't understand it. But teach me how much you love me. Thank you for sending your son in a manger so that he could die on a cross and pay for whatever wrongs I've done. Thank you for taking my sin out on him. And I, in turn, can walk in peace with you. From this day on, I give you myself. Teach me how to follow you. Teach me simply how to live Christmas every day and be yours. For the rest of us, we probably won't hear it in a song. We might not find it in lights or wrapping paper and tinsel or on our tree. May we never, ever forget the reason is sin. That's Christmas. The motive was God's love. That's what the manger is necessary for. Easter culminates the story. There's a cross and you and I have a decision to make. Father, may we walk in that decision this season. May your love transform the way we see ourselves and may that be a source, you God, the source of love, of how we love others, the way you gave us an example to love others while you walk this earth. Thank you, Father, for taking us back to Christmas. Amen. We hope that you were challenged and encouraged by what we shared today. We would also love for you to head over to our website, one, to click on that Christmas outreach banner, two, to donate, and three, to connect with us by filling out a communication card. We'd love to hear from you and we'd love to be praying for you. Until then, we'll see you next time.